today's World Insight with Jim Wei, remembering the legacy of Jin Yong, brought martial heroes to life with his epic work. I don't like to repeat myself, so I always try something new in my writing, whether it's the characters or the plot. And urgent need for Europe to put up its own defense strategy. Down to earth answers from our interview. Welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. The world-renowned Chinese martial arts novelist Louis Cha Liangyong were widely known by his name, pen name in fact, Jin Yong. He passed away at the age of 94 at a hospital in Hong Kong on Tuesday. He's regarded as the greatest ever Chinese wuxia or martial arts and chivalry writer a reputation he earned on the strength of 15 novels and short stories from 1955 to 1972. The whole nation is remembering him. Here's a look back at the life of China's Tolkien. Sorrow and tributes have been spreading within Chinese communities across the globe after famed martial arts novelist Cha Liang Yong, better known as Jin Yong, died in Hong Kong at the age of 94. Mr. Cha's son-in-law said a literary giant was surrounded by family members when he died in Tuesday afternoon. This was confirmed by Hong Kong's Ming Pao newspaper, which was founded by Mr. Cha. In 1955, he published his first martial arts novel, The Book and the Sword, in the New Evening Post, under the pen name Jin Yong. It was an instant success, and he went on to write 14 hugely popular novels and short stories, the last was The Deer and the Cauldron in 1972. Cha rewrote the Chinese wuxia or martial arts genre by adding history and popular culture to a previously formulaic field. His novels are marked by strong characterization and plot and are classified as new school wuxia. I don't like to repeat myself, so I always try something new in my writing whether it's the characters or the plots. The range of his popularity, over 100 million copies sold worldwide, and countless adaptations in films and dramas, and even video games. I think as long as there are novels in the world, the Chinese will probably still read Jin Yang's novels. I would be very satisfied if someone is still reading my novels after 50 or 60 years. For more on the legacy of Jin Yong, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Teng Jimeng, a freelance movie critic and also cultural commentator. In London, we have Paul Engels, who's an editor at McLehol's Press and also editor of Jin Yong's novel, A Hero Born. What a pleasure to have both of you gentlemen to be with us here. Uh, one of the things I would love to ask you first, uh, uh, Mr. Engels, is about your views of what his works are about that make people so fascinated? Well, uh, first, thank you very much for having Good me to with you today. Uh, it's a very, it's a very sad occasion, uh, the death of Jin Yong, and uh, but also an uh, occasion to celebrate one of the world's greatest writers in our time, and I think in all times. And um, a hero born is, is this is the the novel that we're speaking of. This is what we've called the first of four volumes of Legends of the Condor Heroes. Right. And uh, my, um, I think that Jin Yong's appeal is partly in the way that he brings history to a popular audience. The, the Chinese history is fascinating, multifaceted, it goes over thousands of years and Jin Yong's books spread across uh, this history. Which part and of history? And it's the most Which accessible way. Which part of history, Mr. Engels? 
for example, the books that you well, are holding, in which the, part of history that fascinates people? What part of history is he well, this, not a man-made, or is it or a copy of the real history? And why is that that people are so fascinated by it? Well, I, I can't presume to say why he was fascinated. I imagine that it, 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 um, he, he lived through a time of, uh, of uh, very interesting times. He, he lived through um, the, uh, the, uh, the, war, the Second World War and what followed. And the Legends of the Condor Heroes, as we know, is set uh, in the, the time when the Jin and the Song dynasties were vying for mastery of China. And I think... Um, for me, this is a fascinating period because you also have the involvement of Genghis Khan and the Mongols, mm -hmm. and because it, uh, his books show how rich the culture was in China at that time for thousands of years. People have been working on arts such as calligraphy and the martial arts. The, uh, yes. the weapons and warfare they had were very advanced for the time. And the cities were huge. The Grand Canal, which ran across China, mm -hmm. had been there for many years already, and that was a huge feat of... Um, of um, man-made man um, uh, work on the topography of the world, and that um, it's nothing has been ma nothing could match it in Western Europe at the time, and that's partly fascinating. Okay. Even though in, in Western Europe we had, yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Engels. It seems that uh, you have uh, given us a very general impression. I thought you probably could have some stories to tell us. Maybe late, wait for later. Uh, Professor Tang, you've been studying okay. your notes earlier. <laughs> uh, but one thing you do not need to study the notes is people's fascination about his novels. I'm sure you have been reading some of his works uh, back in the university days. Many of us, you know, under the quilt at night, we try to use the flashlight in order to read because those books were actually kind of taboo during the school days because the teachers does not want students to read too much so-called unuseful or not useful books. Professor Tang. Well, absolutely, you're right. I think this is almost like um, a, um, something that I always look back to these university days. Uh, I mean, reading under a bed cover I and mean, under the table and for fear of being discovered yes. to read uh, like this decadent and uh, feudal <laughs> sort of uh, um, uh, superstitious... Part guilty, part fascinating, right? Yeah, Isn't absolutely. It? But, Professor, why these works are so fascinating to you and so many around China. I mean, worldwide, his books sold 300 million. Well, and in China, probably much more than yeah, that number. Yeah, yeah. Well, first thing first, I think it's because the, the great literary tradition that he tried to revive after the kind of vandalism, uh, the kind of uh, elimination of this Asian heritage part of the culture, especially classical literature since the 1960s, made basically yeah. the Cultural Revolution. And so first thing first is the literature. Secondly, it's, it's history, it's politics. And uh, for example, uh, Jean, most of Jin Yong's works actually uh, help us on this journey back into history, the history of uh, Jin Yuan and also Ming. Uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all these great historical stories being revived through these great characters through martial arts, which is the third point I'd like to touch upon. I think yeah. martial arts being revitalized by this great author using so much and so many of these great literary allusions, historical names, and also the great and powerful uh, see, martial arts skill names. That's right. But I have to say, Professor Tang, there's one thing we don't want the audience to mistaken, that is the things that he's been writing in the book are not necessarily a real copy of the history. No, they are There's fantasies. A lot of, there are a lot of fantasy yeah. stories mm -hmm. related to maybe minor facts of what happened at certain time and became a beautiful novel. Having said that, though, um, we see very much, uh, Mr. Engels, in his books, there's something called the Jianghu, I hope mm. when you are translating and working on these books, you will also understand that phrase, which means literally rivers and lakes. But actually, it means a sphere in which characters, men and women, will be able to seek justice and love and wisdom in an entangled world eventually. How important is it, Mr. Angles, when you are reading his works, that this tradition, this idea, has become. Um, it's, it's a fundamental concept of the works, and but um, I 
for me, I think it's... A lot of people have asked me, how are Western readers going to understand this if they don't understand these fundamental concepts, uh, for example? And I think that it's, it's quite universal, I think, to how we behave uh, uh, with each other around the world. I find there's, there's lots of, um, of parallels with uh, the uh, European idea of chivalry and going as far as um, the, um, the behaviour of the characters in the works of Alexandre Dumas, who I believe that Jin Yong is uh, often compared to. So it's the context with which we view the, um, the characters' actions. So we have a certain expectation that they will behave in certain ways. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the drama comes from when they differ from those norms. Mm. What about that for you, Professor Tang? I mean, for Chinese gentleman Jiang Hu <laughs> has been a phrase and a fascination. Uh, and yet, is it only man-made? Or there's something like that? Or there's something similar to it but we could never grasp it and that's why we're so fascinated about everything described in the novels of Jin Yong. Well, I think that Jiang Hu is almost like a quintessential Chinese concept, uh, deeply rooted in the traditional and psychological, perhaps the psyche of the nation, which really, uh, I mean, the concept of which really hold on our popular imagination. It has three meanings to me. First thing first, it is associated with martial arts and chivalry. I mean, this, unima this imagined world and perhaps underworld of a group of huskers and also uh, martial arts um, masters right. traveling across different landscapes to compete <laughs> and to fight and to win uh, in a sense to address wrongs and uh, in, in a sense to profess the greatness and for I mean for the, the people in this in and outside this very particular world and secondly I think Jianghu also means the realm outside the imperial rich the the, the kind of a world in which that people would operate outside mm. the existing law and order and Thirdly, I think it is also a cultural concept in which mm -hmm. that means that people can make uh, can freely play uh, a full play of their imagination, meaning freedom, mean almost a free willing freedom that allow one to travel and to do and to think freely. Right. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, joining us, we also have from Boston Petrus Liu, who is an associate professor at Boston University from the BU. He is also the author of Stateless Subjects. Chinese martial arts literature and post-colonial history. Sounds very academic, but uh, Mr. <laughs> Liu, <laughs> I'm sure you have your own understanding of the word Jianghu and the kind of image and imagination uh, Jin Yong has managed yes. throughout decades to create for the Chinese. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, so in my work, I actually translated Jianghu as statelessness. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't catch part of the conversation because I just just joined in late because of a technical difficulty. But I, um, I think, you know, the in, important thing here is that a lot of people think that in martial arts fiction where, um, you know, the kind of fiction is popular and uh, anti-statist, but I think it is actually elaborating a kind of new ethics that is not centered on the formation of the state or nation building programs mm -hmm. and it's not nationalist yeah mm, interesting uh, well is it a nation state issue professor Tang? you see um many of the works portrayed particular characters most well known such as guo jing yep. and, and some of the others in the novels of jin yong are actually about a nation state concept about Chinese, the history of the Chinese throughout thousands of years. So is he a nationalist or is he um, a romantic uh, author who has been trying to inspire himself through the ups and downs of history? I think he wears three caps. I think he's first thing first he's a novelist and secondly I think he's a historian and lastly I think he's also uh, a politician, perhaps, because he's heavily involved in politics ever since the 1950s by starting Mingbao and also writing such great history. And so, in this sense, I think it is nation building. It is part of searching for the cultural and political uh, identity of a nation 
uh, in transition and transformation, especially since 1978. Mm -hmm. And so to me, Jin Yong is, is, a, is a kind of a virtuoso, I mean, deeply involved in interpreting and creating and sometimes, I hope, right. rein, reinventing China. Interestingly speaking, if you look at some of the most important quotes coming from uh, Jin Yong, the writer himself, Mr. Engels, he's been talking about life is like a fight, then you leave it quietly. You see a lot of very, shall I say, a very romantic way, but certainly also a, a way of bravery that he has been illustrating in his way of life uh, and also in reflect that in his novels. How much of it are actually remaining in the imaginations of the Chinese and therefore it's absolutely beautiful when they see that in the novels. How much of it are the reality of the Chinese lives? These are fascinating questions, isn't it, Mr. Engels? It is a fascinating question. I'm, a, I'm afraid I wasn't able quite to hear the full context of it. Could you just repeat it again for me? Well, okay. He says something like, life is like a fight. Then you leave it quietly. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you see a very chivalrous spirit and so also a man of bravery and also a man of mm -hmm. vision in a way. But the question is, is this a romantic version of what the reality is or this is part of reality, Mr. Engels? Um, I think it can, it, I think it's certainly both. Um, I think, um, it is, I mean, I, his, I, to me his writings certainly are a romantic version of, of, um, of historical events with, with different characters and added characters and, and, um, but I think it's, I think they have, um, when something is as popular as as Jin Yong's works have been, they become they begin to not so much alter reality, but they certainly alter people's perceptions of reality. Mm. So, and people begin to live by what the tenets in his books. People they define themselves um, against so people who have grown up wanting to be like his characters or wanting to be not like his villains. So. When something is so popular, I think the, diff the where romanticization and reality, mm. I think the lines between them blur a little bit. Mm. Is it, Mr. Engel, uh, Mr. Liu? Glad you're joining us, Mr. Salad. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Would you like to respond uh, to what? Would you like to respond to what the other panelist has to say, or can you hear me? Yeah, I only heard, I only caught the second half of, um, I think, Paul's Okay, uh, so comments. let me ask you, whether it is romantic version of reality that Mr. Jin Yong created in his novels, or actually people are looking at the Jiang Hu, all of these chivalry concepts, and uh, in actually the realities of Chinese life, Mr. Liu, very briefly from you. Oh. Uh, Oh, I think, uh, okay, I, I see, thank you. Yeah, well, I think, you know, first, you know, we want to think about the notion of chivalry. Uh, I think, you know, that um, even though, you know, martial arts fiction is translated as martial arts and chivalrous fiction, um, it's not about um, propagating a, a fixed idea of what it means to be heroic or brave for people to imitate. Rather, I think this kind of fiction is extremely complex in terms of plot and language, and it's, it creates scenes of ethical dilemmas for mm -hmm. you to consider, rather than uh, values and norms for you to imitate. So for example, you know, I have al often been fascinated by a parallel between two different novels that Jin Yong has written. Uh, in one scenario, the uh, hero, the protagonist, is asked to join a faction that he was raised to believe as evil. And in the other novel, there is a very similar situation. And what happens in the two stories are completely different. So I don't think you know, there is a fixed message that Jin Yong wants to send out. Rather, he wants to question how we have come to accept certain beliefs and values as absolute um, uh, standards of mor morality. Mm -hmm. And you know, and also think that um, 
you know, throughout 20th century, 20th, 20th, 20th century, you know, there's a prejudice against martial arts fiction because people thought that, um, you know, this kind of fiction, you know, was really a remnant of feudal China and traditional value. And in the early 20th century, um, Chinese critics, you know, actually said that the existence of martial arts fiction was a reason why we couldn't have a revolution. It was a de deflection <laughs> of the revolutionary consciousness mm. of the people and, and providing an escapist fantasy. I think, you know, that martial arts, you know, fiction has been grossly misunderstood. That's because a wonderful of this idea way that when you put it that way. It certainly leads yeah. us to the next debate about whether the martial art mo uh, novels, such as those written by Jin Yong, have revived the people's fascination about the so-called yeah. traditional culture, or it is creating a mirage or a fake uh. version of the traditional culture. That's a very interesting question, isn't it, Professor Tang? Yeah, I mean, I, um, Jin Yong has been always a master in terms of uh, creating a mirror. I mean, this is almost like um, a long-term Chinese uh, tradition on the part of literati such as Jin Yong. I think um, uh, he would use literature as a mirror to reflect upon this long-gone past and to allow us to see a glimpse of, the, to, to seek a glimpse of the present. And so, it, to, to many people, I think that Jin Yong is Ying Shu, I mean, shooting mm -hmm. from the shadows. I mean, using literature to comment on the present day uh, society and any society, perhaps, back in the past, in the future, right. and, and lead us uh, to, that may lead us to a, a unknown future in this sense. Unknown future, isn't that fascinating? However, we do know that Jin Yong's novels were not just influential in Chinese speaking countries, but also translated into Koreans, English, Japanese. Japanese, French, Vietnamese, Indonesian, and more. His books sold 300 million, as we mentioned earlier, worldwide. But crucial thing about Jin Yong's works is that, take a look at the very first character of the names of his novels, and put together, they become a beautiful Chinese couplet. Translating into English, it goes like this. Whirling slow blankets the sky, and I hunt the white deers. Laughing as I write legends of chivalry and romance. Isn't he quite a man? Having heard this quote coming from the very first character of all his novels named. So, uh, once again, I want to go to you, Mr. Liu. The Chinese language itself. Today, what we speak is very different from what people spoke earlier in the last few centuries. And the beauty of the Chinese language, particularly the right. ancient language, is very much different from the rhythm of our language yes. today. How do we see Jin Yong's function in that way to bridge and link the past and the present? Yes, um, that's a great question. Um, Jin Yong has actually once said that Lu uh, Xun Ba Jing Lao Shi, you know, the revered fathers of modern Chinese literature, didn't actually write um, modern Chinese literature. They merely wrote Western literature in the Chinese language. <laughs> and, you know, that's a very provocative claim. And I think there's some truth to that, actually, because Jin Yong is, in my mind, the only author who has successfully revitalized and pre preserved the traditional Chinese vernacular uh, tradition of linked chapter fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and you know there are all, there are all kinds of political reasons why you know that tradition has come to be devalued right. and challenged in early 20th century China when people embraced in the Western norms of uh, 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 conventions of literary techniques. And, but you know, but Jin Yong didn't give up. You know, he wanted to continue and expand on what is interesting and unique right. about the Chinese literary tradition. And I think that also says something about you know the difficulty of, and complexity of his language and the reasons why you know we haven't yet fully translated all of his works. Um, um, you know, a lot that of people actually say that Jin Yong is untranslatable. Yeah. Right. That actually is a fascinating topic. Yeah. I'm afraid we are running out of time for this discussion, despite of some of the technical difficulties. But still, thank you so much. I learned a lot through the conversations we are having right now. Tang Ji Meng, Hao Angus, and Petrus Liu. We hope we are going to discuss this in the near future. This is not just a remembrance, it's a celebration of Mr. Jin Yong's works, and certainly the literature, traditional martial arts movie, and novels. Thank you.